It is important to recognize that a crisis is not an event. A crisis is our reaction to any event. Often the reason we are numb is to enable us to muster our resources to be able to cope with what has happened. So let's talk about coping with grief. Coping with grief? What does that mean? Coping with grief? That phrase makes me angry. I hated it when it was suggested that if I read a book or did a few exercises that I would be able to cope with my grief. That seemed to trivialize what I was going through. The book was helpful and all, but it's going to take a lot more than that to help me get over this. How am I supposed to cope with something that has torn me apart? <sighs> well, okay. <laughs> Actually, Heather's asking a very good question. How am I supposed to cope with something that's torn me apart? The word bereaved comes from the root word reeve, which means to be torn apart. The word crisis in its Latin and Greek origins mean to separate. But in one sense, that's a little bit too nice, like we're going to separate the boys from the girls. The actual meaning of crisis is to be ripped apart. That's what losing someone we love feels like. And like Humpty Dumpty, maybe some days we wonder if we will ever be able to put the pieces back together again. So in response to Heather's significant comment, what does it mean to cope with grief? The original word means a covering. Coping means closing up the wound that has torn us apart. Now, we're not just talking about band-aids here. A band-aid is a covering, but I doubt if it would be very effective when someone's been torn apart. I wouldn't want to delude anyone into thinking that there's some easy way to overcome grief. Coping doesn't mean getting over it or whitewashing the very real losses that you've experienced. Coping means gathering all our resources and finding ways to heal the wound. Coping is understood from a cognitive-based perspective, which means that coping involves comprehending the implications of the situation, planning our responses, and evaluating outcomes. So I think we're on solid ground when we talk about learning to cope. I would like to suggest uh, maybe that's one of the reasons we, we have such an issue in terms of, of, of the length of time that we spend coming to terms with grief and, and, and the whole issue of mourning because we, we, we don't confront the issues that we perhaps need to confront at, at the beginning of, 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 of the process. That would certainly account for down the road, three to four months down the road, people having sleeplessness, <coughs> having anxiety attacks, having migraine headaches, all kinds of physical symptoms that they wonder now, you know, it's been a long time now, it's, you know, I should be over this, but they really haven't dealt with anything at all. The reality is the whole grief process is so individualized that for one person four months might be enough for them to, to come to terms with, with, with their loss. For someone else it might be two or three or four or even five years. I think so. one of the most significant things for me was I read in Bill's book that the uh, funeral director gave me and um, it was you know to be prepared in three months mm -hmm. that your friends will stop calling, the meals will stop coming and it's you know not that they don't care about you and they're not thinking about you it's that their lives have moved on. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was amazing, like it, almost to the day of three months, I would come home and there'd be no messages on the machine. And I thought that was really good for me to know that was coming. And so that's one thing that I've passed on to some of my friends, that certainly nobody stops thinking about you. It's just that their lives have moved on. I can remember right after my son's death, uh, within a, a week, uh, this, the funeral was on the Friday, and on Monday I went back to work. And the reason I went back to work, it, I didn't have to do any work. It was a safe place for me. Mm -hmm. There, I could shut my door, forward my phone, and all of a sudden there wouldn't be somebody coming up. Are you okay? How are you feeling today? Well, how am I supposed to feel? Mm -hmm. So I, I could just sit there and cry all day if that's what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. And that was... A, there were people I know that would say, how could you be back at work all, all, already? 
And it's like, mm. I had to deal the best way I could with the situation. And I found that for me was when my husband died, I was uh, working as a, in a hospice situation and mm -hmm. that was my support. And you're, I'm with you, I, I had, to, had to have some structure in my life at that point. Mm -hmm. And I was with people who knew what I was struggling with. Um, and I would just say, don't talk to me nicely because I'll probably start crying. You know, I, I didn't want to ruin my makeup at work either. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you, but you like, you knew that there were people there who, if you needed that yeah. support, mm -hmm. but they weren't going to be um, fawning all over you or being, oh, you poor dear kind of thing. They knew enough from what we had been doing that that, that was not something that I, I particularly needed. Maybe some other folks did too. Yeah. I couldn't imagine not not having some structure in my life. And people say, oh, why don't you take off six weeks or something? I said, well, what am I going to do for six weeks? Um, three days, is that realistic? But people who are having a baby get a year off work. Yeah. So should grieving people get a year off work? I think the important thing to remember is whether it's a few days or a few weeks, that structure mm -hmm. is an antidote for chaos. Yes. Because when someone right. dies, <coughs> your, your world's turned upside down. Everything seems chaotic. And getting back into some kind of a structure I think is a very right. important part. Some people might think that being extremely busy is an avo avoidance, but not for me. Because my son is with me all the time, and everything I get involved with is something where my son was involved with, with me. So it's not really an avoidance as much as a, a, an approach to the grief. I think you begin to learn to cope when you're willing to take the following steps. Coping means that you do not allow the past to totally destroy the present. Coping means that despite going through a negative and even destructive experience, that you still have your heart and your soul, your self-respect and your life. Coping with grief then means you are learning to live with the sorrow without allowing it to plummet you into despair. You see, grief is often so unfamiliar to people that when they first experience the full force of it, sometimes weeks after the actual death, they feel that something is wrong with them. But grief is a natural, albeit difficult, part of life, helping us not to get over the experience but to get through it. I think there are four signposts towards learning to cope. Number one, dealing with your loss directly and constructively. Number two, making an effort to confront your scars. Number three, taking steps to make your life as it is in the present as fulfilling and meaningful as possible. Yes, to be honest, maybe there was a split second when I felt like ending it all. I spoke to my minister about that, and she was wonderful. She told me that such feelings were natural. It wasn't that I wanted to die. It's that I was really wondering how I could find the strength and the resolve to go on living. I think now that she was right. Perhaps it is a bit less frightening when we realize that Experiencing an emotion doesn't mean we have to act on it. And number four, beginning to accept rather than deny or fight the changes that this loss has brought to your life. Realizing these truths helps to lighten the burden of grief, or at least to put it in a more meaningful context. I will not put it on the back burner. I'm not going to sit around and say, well, this didn't happen. Hopefully I'm going to forget about it. Tomorrow's going to be a better day. Uh, I hope tomorrow's going to be a better day. There are some hours that are great. Uh, and there are some times that are not so great. I think before it's set in seriously, I think it probably took a little over a year. I mean, today, I mean, there are still moments where I say this is unbelievable. But I, took, I think it took a little over a year to believe it. And I think I, I, because I surrounded myself with him, with pictures and talking about him to everyone, made it believable. 
in such a short period of time, I don't know whether a year is a short period of time or not, or just a little over a year, but it's very believable today. I was surprised at myself being angry with him because that's really not how I feel. But but I know it was anger. I I um, I've just been left with so many different things to cope with and so many different things to do. I think a large part of learning to cope is finding the confidence to go on. What surprises people after their loss and what astonishes the people who knew them before is that there is often a fundamental loss of confidence that occurs. It was hard to go out. I'd lost touch with many of my friends. I'd put my own involvements to the side. So when I did go out, all evening or throughout the movie I'd gone to see, I'd be thinking, I should be looking after Mom. How will she manage? Will she be okay? It was crazy, because I knew she was dead. But in my heart, I'm still feeling I should be there and looking after her. I like to think of myself as a pretty competent and efficient person. I have a business. I like to feel my life is pretty well organized. But after she died, all my confidence seemed to go out of the window. I would worry about stuff I'd never worried about before. I mean everyday things like tidying up, getting groceries, getting to work, making decisions. Things that normally I would take in my stride suddenly became like Herculean labors. People would say, come on, Michael, what's wrong with you? You've done this before, you can handle this. But it was just a fundamental loss of confidence in everything, in myself. People who suffer a loss often feel lost. After a death, a surviving spouse or family member often feels as if all of the familiar boundaries within which life was lived are missing. We feel disoriented, even in the most familiar settings. Of course, when that happens, you begin to think, I'm losing it. This is driving me crazy. I'm losing my mind. I never realized how difficult it is for a grieving person to begin to pick up the pieces and just do some of the things that have been part of your life. In this situation, people may feel lost because events are not unfolding according to the script. This is not the way life was supposed to be, not according to the hopes and dreams of their life plan. The expectation was that this could not or would not happen. We all somehow feel that we are immune from the tragedies of life. These things happen to other people, not to me. Family and friends may also feel disoriented for many reasons, not least of which is that if this can happen to them, it can happen to any of us. What many people do not realize is that there can be a fundamental loss of confidence that affects a grieving person. I am right-handed. I learned to write when I was about four or five years old. Since then, when I want to write something, I take my pen in my right hand and I write. I know how to do it. I can write my signature almost with my eyes closed. I know how to write. But let's imagine that something happened and I lost my right hand. I would have to learn to write with my left hand. I know how to write, but if I take my pen in the left hand, well, it isn't quite so confident. I can do it, but it's slower and more shaky because I'm not used to writing with my left hand, so I'm not as confident. While the loss of someone you loved has torn you apart, and it feels like you've lost your right arm, you're having to live your life without that person who brought a sense of balance and confidence and stability to your life. You're living life without the right arm that has always been there. So when people say, you've done this before, just smile and say, yes, 
but now I'm using my other hand because my right hand is missing. I'm sure you see the point. You can learn to manage without your right hand, but it takes time and practice and increasing confidence. So every time you do something for the first time, you commend yourself. It may be as simple as cooking a dinner or going out to a party, a wedding or a social function. Again, some people may say, what's the big deal? But it is a big deal because you're not used to doing it without the person who has died. Remember, the smallest victory is a major triumph. You are learning to cope without your right arm. You will make it, but be patient and understanding with yourself if it takes you a while.